So we're in Hosea 7 through 9 this morning. Our chapters in Hosea are meant to teach Israel a very basic lesson, one of those lessons that you would like to think is universal enough that it would be unnecessary, Uh, but sadly it's not. And it's also one of those lessons that, even though most everybody knows it, it's kind of hard to live out. And the lesson is simply, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. God is letting Israel know that he is not judging them because he is a cruel and petty tyrant. But Israel practiced a lifestyle of godless immorality for generation after generation. And now the nation is reaping what they have sowed. So we're looking at three chapters this morning. And the middle verse of the middle of those three chapters is, For they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. So Israel's been sowing the wind for years. They've been sowing emptiness, a bankrupt character, a depraved lifestyle, and now they're going to reap the storm for what they have been storing up. Chapter 7 of Hosea is a picture of three illustrations on how Israel has been living uh, in, in their relationship with the Lord. So this is the Lord having three image pictures of Israel. And then chapter 8 is about the wind that they've been sowing. And then chapter 9 is the storm that will be le- unleashed upon them. So in chapter 7, we begin with three imager- images to describe how Israel has been living. The first is in verses 1 through 10. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. With their wickedness they make the king glad, and the princes with their lies." They are adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with scoffers, for their hearts are like an oven as they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. All of them are are hot like an oven. And they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them call on me. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. Ephraim has become a cake, not turned. Strangers devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs also are sprinkled on him, yet he does not know it. Though the pride of Israel testifies against him, yet they have not returned to the Lord their God, nor have they sought him for all this." So the first image that God uses to picture how the nation of Israel is living is that Israel is a burnt cake. Now, when we say a burnt cake, you need to think of a burned pancake, not of something like a burned birthday cake or something like that. The image is that Israel is like a ladle of batter that you've poured out on a griddle or on some some hot stones. But after you put it on that hot griddle, instead of flipping it at the right time to, you know, when you see the bubbles start to come up on the one side and then, you know, it's time to flip your pancake so it's nice and golden on both sides. Instead of flipping it, you just leave it there. And so the result is you have a burned pancake on one side, which is disgusting and nobody wants to eat it. And on the other side, it's raw and doughy and it's disgusting and no one wants to eat it. Neither side is cooked to an edible temperature. So God needs to throw out what was left on the fire for too long. So the question is, why is this picture of a burned cake a good illustration of Israel? Well, we should ask ourselves, How do we feel when we are sorely tempted and we are constantly striving to give into that temptation to sin? Uh, The feeling of temptation very often is the feeling of burning. We burn with the passion of lust. We burn in lust for our pride. Uh, We're like a drunk who sweats when they drink too much. Drinking too much alcohol literally speeds up your heart rate and makes you hot and sweaty. And Israel is burning in her sin. 
So God says that he came to heal Israel, uh, that is Ephraim and Syria, in hopes of healing her. But instead of being healed, God found them burning with a deadly fever due to their sin. And the tragedy of it was that Israel's like, no, we like the burning fever from our sin. They didn't want to be released from it, but they wanted to even stoke and feed the fires even more. And the sad part is that she's in this state where she is so grossly burned and undercooked that she is inevitable before the Lord and in her state where she is just sort of desensitized and burned because of her sin, there are two things that are happening to her that she can't even recognize is going on. One, we read that strangers are devouring her and she doesn't even know it. So this is the idea of the nations surrounding Israel are slowly plundering off her wealth and resources and she doesn't even recognize what's going on. And second, that gray hairs are being sprinkled upon Israel. And the idea that gray hairs is meant to say that the nation is becoming elderly and is about to keel over and die. So Israel's about to die. The resources are being taken from them. And because they're burning in their sins and their passions and their lust so much, they don't even realize what is happening to them as a nation. So this is God saying, I wanted to heal you. I came to give you grace and mercy, but you were like, no, Lord, we like the sauna. Crank it up even more. We want it hot. We want to burn in our passions and in our pride and in our drink. And then in the next picture that God gives of Israel is he says that Israel is like a silly dove. So verses 11 through 14. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. When they go, I will spread my net over them. I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. And they do not cry out to me from their heart when they wail on their beds. For the sake of grain and new wine, they have assembled themselves." They turn away from me. So to understand what this image of the silly dove meant, I had to get a little bit of help from Charles Feinberg. I think Charles Feinberg is one of the great Old Testament minds of the 20th century. And Feinberg wrote that during this time period, the dove was actually a proverbial bird. And what the bird, the dove stood for was of a lover who was too foolish to remember the love that she belonged for. People were told, don't become attached to dove birds because a dove will come to whoever can whistle and call to it and it won't look back to its previous owner when the next person's calling to it and walking away with that silly bird. So back in that time period, someone would say, oh, that teenage girl or that teenage boy, they're just like a silly dove. In other words, whatever person who is their age, who looks at them the right way, like, you know, I think you're, they're just going to follow after the next one. And then when they're that one and somebody else you know, gives them that wink eye, they're going to they're go chase after this one. And so God's saying, Israel is just like that silly dove. No matter who calls to her, she goes running. Israel did not remain loyal to Yahweh. If Egypt would call, she'd go after Egypt. If Assyria called, she'd go after Assyria. And every time she'd go after these nations, she'd come back home and bring more of those gods with her and pile them up in their nation. So Israel did not remain loyal to the Lord, but went after other nations. And this also talks about how God's been bringing smaller judgments upon Israel, uh, smaller destructions on the nation to try to coax them to come back, uh, but they have not been responding to those smaller forms of judgment. Uh, If you want to read about those, you can read about the ministries of Elijah and Elisha and see about the disciplines that God brought upon Israel through the ministry of those two prophets. And the one thing that's clear about the ministries of Elijah and Elisha is that they did a lot of miraculous, like crazy miraculous stuff that revealed the power, the judgment, the glory of the Lord. And how did Israel respond? I think kind of just a, you know, 
That's, that's interesting that you're doing that, Elijah. No, no desire. And then the Lord says it's because they're hoping to find grain and wine with their new lovers that they go after, and that is what they're looking for, and they are turning from the Lord. So Israel's like a burnt pancake. She's burning her lust. She's like a silly dove. She's going after lovers in other nations. And finally, she is a defective bow. That's in verses 15 and 16. Although I trained and strengthened their arms... Yet they devise evil against me. They turn, but not upward. They are like a deceitful bow. The princes, their princes will fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This will be their derision in the land of Egypt. So the idea of the deceitful bow is that Israel, the Lord gave Israel everything she needed to be a strong instrument in his hands for his glory. He gave Israel the promises to Abraham. He gave them the law of Moses. He gave them the promised land. Everything was there for Israel to be a beacon of light for the Lord. But when the Lord picked up to use Israel as an instrument for his glory, they deceived him. It's like you're a soldier and you're running out of the ramparts to defend your castle and you see a row of these finely crafted bows in order to fight back against the invading army and you pick up one of those beautiful bows, you go to pull it back and one of two things happen. Either you go to pull it back and the string just breaks and obviously the arrow goes nowhere, or the string's too long. So you go to pull it back, and you let the string go, and if the string's too long in a bow, what's going to happen to your arrow? It's just going to kind of flop forward. And so the Lord's saying, you, you look at Israel, and you should be able to say, oh, I did everything possible to make her strong, to be a light to the nations, and instead of doing that, she deceived me. She lied against the Lord. She mocked him. And now Israel, we become a mockery as far away as Egypt because of her disobedience. So when the Lord talks about what Israel is sowing that brings about their judgment, he begins with these sort of three very simple to understand illustrations. That Israel is being judged because she's a burned pancake that tastes disgusting because of the way that she's living. She's a silly dove. She's flying after everybody who's going to call for her. And she's a deceitful bow. And that is God didn't want to just simply raise up Israel for the sake of Israel, but he wanted Israel to be his light, his glory, his message to the world of his greatness. But instead of Israel doing that, they were praising and proclaiming other gods that were surrounding them. And now we learn uh, specifically what they sow by God bringing out the specific actions in verses 1 through 4. So the beginning of chapter 8 is more, here's what they're really doing that fill in the imagery that came in the chapter before. So Hosea 8, 1 through 4 says, Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. They cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. So here we have a simple list of the actions that Israel is doing and that they have been sowing in their land. Uh, first, we read that she has transgressed and rebelled against the law, so they are people of disobedience. So basically, you can look at the law of Moses, and they have been transgressing it entirely. Uh, probably the most tragic would be thinking about all of the chapters on the tabernacle and the sacrifices and the temple and understand that they're obeying none of that at all. So they're transgressing and rebelling. Second, they are crying out in mockery of God. They are saying, we of Israel, we know you, Lord. And then the question is, why is it mockery for Israel to say they know God? Shouldn't that be a good thing for Israel to say they know God? Well, the reason that it is a cry of mockery and not of intimacy, we, we see in verses 5 and 6 when we read, He, that is God, has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, My anger burns against them. How long will they be capable of innocence? For from Israel is even this, 
A craftsman made it, so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. So what Hosea is saying here is that when Israel cries out, My God, we know you, the person that they're saying is God, the person that they're saying is the Lord, is a calf that has been sculpted in Samaria. So that's why that is a cry of mockery. They're saying this craft that was made by man's hands is what delivered us out of Egypt. To which God then responds by saying, How can something that a craftsman in Samaria, fixed and fashioned with his hands, hundreds of years after the Exodus, be the God that led you out of Egypt. It doesn't make any sense. It cannot be true. This is not your God. And so for Israel to say, we know the Lord, we know God, that is a cry of mockery. Because what they're saying is, it is the calf that, is, uh, that has been made in Samaria that is our God. Their third sin is that they have rejected the good. Uh, this is pretty basic, and that means they've rejected principles of kindness, honesty, humility, exclusivity to the Lord. We've been sort of tracing these throughout. Uh, fourth, we read that they have set up kings not by the Lord. And we need to remember that there is one kingly line for God's people that was set up by the Lord. And who is that one kingly line? It is the line of David. So the nation of Israel never had a divinely ordained king. At times they had kings that were set apart by God. But if you look at the way that those kings were set apart, God wasn't setting them apart to be king. He was setting them apart to judge the previous kingly dynasty. And then they come in and take authority when if they were living godly, they would have deposed the previous kings and then said, let's go down and make Uzziah or Hezekiah our king. But that never happened. So they had kings that were not set up by God. And then finally, they had the multiplication of idols. So they've made idols for themselves. The golden calf in Samaria wasn't enough. They had to build idols to a pantheon of gods. They had to worship at all of the high places throughout Israel. Uh, their idolatry really knew no limits as they added God upon God to their worship of the Lord. So this is what Israel has been sowing, not for five years, not for ten years, but for generation, generation, generation. We're talking probably about 350, 400 years at this point. So actually, if we think about how long we've been living in America, how long America's existed, that's pretty much close to the length of time uh, that Israel was living against the Lord. Although we're not even to that point in America now that I'm thinking about it. 1776, we're not even close to how long Israel was before God judged them. So it was a while that they were living this way. And then we discover that because of what they're sowing, now we begin to see what they're reaping starting in verse 7 of the second half of chapter 8. For they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the nations like a vessel in which no one delights. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey all alone. Ephraim has hired lovers, even though they hire allies among the nations. Now I will gather them up, and they will begin to diminish because of the burden of the king of princes. Since Ephraim has multiplied offers for sin... They have become altars of sinning for him. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they are regarded as a strange thing. As for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it. But the Lord has taken no delight in them. He will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. But I will send a fire on its city that it may consume its palatial dwellings. So first, what we see in the rest of chapter 8 is that the first form of judgment that has been brought upon them is that they have lost the presence and the joy of the Lord. So they are sacrificing 
sacrifices all day long in Israel. But the tragedy is, is that the Lord is taking no delight in those sacrifices because they're not offering those sacrifices to worship the Lord himself. They're offering those sacrifices in some, for some reasons to appease themselves, to make them feel better about the lives that they're doing, to appease other gods. So they're offering all of these sacrifices and they're getting nothing out of it. Israel has forgotten his maker and so now the Lord will forget Israel. So the focus on Israel and Judah was sadly on earthly rewards and earthly treasures. They were going after the kingdom of Assyria. They were wanting the wealth of that growing empire. They were hoping that by their attachment to Assyria, they could build more palaces. They could build more fortresses in order to increase their wealth. Uh, but sadly, what's going to happen is that instead of Assyria saying, oh, yeah, we're going to be best buds and we're going to hang out together and, and we're going to trade with you and we're all going to become prosperous together, is that Assyria is going to come in and just simply say, well, we want to be prosperous from you, but not by peacefully trading together. We want to be prosperous with you simply by raising your land and taking everything that you have. And so since Israel was seeking earthly profit from Assyria, the Lord was saying, if you want Assyria, you can have them. And you can have a new relationship with them. And so the Lord was going to send a windstorm on them that would knock up everything that they have built up. They're sort of like the parable of the wise man who builds their house on a sand. And that is they were, if you look at the, the political situation with Jeroboam II of this time period, and then Uzziah and Hezekiah, which came before in, in Judah, uh, Israel and Judah both are really expanding in wealth and influence during this time period. Israel is as prosperous as it has ever been during this time, in part because they're getting these really strong alliances to those nations to the north. But the thing is, those nations to the north are like building on sand. And that is, a storm's going to come in, and it's just going to sweep everything that Israel had out into the ocean, out into the northern neighbors, and they're going to take everything that Israel has. So they're, they're building up uh, a very fragile ground, and that's going to just sweep them off to sea. And then we have the storm coming in upon Israel starting at the beginning of chapter 9. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exaltations like the nations. And, and let's just pause here and remember for a second when he says, do not rejoice with exaltations like the nation. We, we need to put this in context to understand that when Hosea was saying this, Everybody would have looked at him and been like, why shouldn't we be rejoicing? Like Jeroboam II, our king, is literally the most powerful king our nation has had. We have the largest borders we've ever had. They had a, such a good relationship with Syria that Israel and Syria were talking about coming in and taking over Judah possibly and making Judah a vassal nation of Syria and Israel. Like, like Israel was doing uh, amazing so the idea of Hosea saying, don't rejoice with the nations is like, so weird that you would say that. Like it makes sense that Hosea would say that from our perspective, because we know what's going to happen. But we need to remember how prophetic this was in the way of being counter everything else in Israel when Hosea said this. This is, a, this is kind of a... a really unforeseeable bit of prophecy in chapter 9, and I want to make sure we understand just how unlikely what Hosea was saying at this time for it to come to pass, and then the fact that it came to pass really shows God's omniscience, his prophetic ability with his prophets. So for him to say, don't rejoice, we need to understand there was a lot of rejoicing going on, and people were like, Jeroboam II, he's, he's our best. And so they were probably getting ready for a whole long line of Jeroboam kings following the second, and it would never happen. So let's continue. For you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and wine press will not feed them, and the new wine will fail them. They will not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt, and in Assyria they will eat unclean food. They will not pour out drink offerings of wine to the Lord. Their sacrifices will not please Him. Their bread will be like mourner's bread. All who eat of it will be defiled. 
for their bread will be for themselves alone. It will not enter the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they will go, up, go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. Memphis will bury them. Weeds will take over their treasures of silver. Thorns will be in their tents. The day of punishment, the days of punishment have come. The days of retribution have come. Let Israel know this. The prophet is a fool. The inspired man is demented because of the grossness of your iniquity and because your hostility is so great. Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a prophet. Yet the snare of a bird catcher is in all his ways, and there is only hostility in the house of his God. They have gone deep in depravity, as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. I have found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit of the fig tree in its first season, but they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame. They became as detestable as that which they loved. So the beginning of chapter 9, like we said, starts by telling them the time of rejoicing is over. It's over because all the things that they want to rejoice over will fail them. No longer will they have crops to bring into the threshing floor. No longer will they have grapes to bring into the wine press. And if you don't have... Uh, wheat to bring into the threshing floor to make bread. If you don't have grapes to go into the wine press to make wine, and you don't have bread and wine, you know what you're not going to have a lot of? Not going to have a lot of parties. Not going to have a lot of good times. Uh, we don't normally contemplate this today because we don't endure medieval or ancient Bronze Age armies invading our country. Uh, but if, if a country is going to invade you back in this time period, the very first impact on your life because of that invader will not be violence, but it will be famine. It'll be famine because those invading troops are going to come in, and once they come in, what are you not going to be able to do? Go harvest your crops or bring anything in. And they're probably going to try to either eat as many of those crops themselves or destroy them so you can't eat them. And then if you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be prepared for this. I'm going to store up my crops. I'm going to make sure that I have food and grain for my family. You know what's probably going to happen to what you've stored up? The king's going to walk in and say, hey, that grain that you've stored up, you know, uh, I could use it to feed my troops. And then he's going to take your food from you. And so famine will be the first result of armies coming into the land. And that's what Israel's picturing here by this famine is Assyria coming in to invade the land. But one of the interesting things about this chapter is that there's a dual focus here of the Israelites going off to Assyria, and also Egypt is mentioned a lot here too. We even have a mention of the city of Memphis, which at that time period, Memphis was the capital of Egypt. And so that's led some people to say, maybe Hosea didn't know what he was talking about, because it seems like he's talking about a, a dual exile, some to Egypt, some to Assyria, when we know that all of the Israelites went to Assyria. Um, uh, but I don't believe that he's saying some are going to go down to Egypt and be destroyed by Egypt and Egypt's going to be involved in that. What I believe Hosea is doing is he's using Egypt to illustrate what Assyria is going to do to them. So when the Israelites would think of Egypt and how Egypt had previously been an adversary of Israel, they would think that Egypt made us slaves. Egypt made us work for them in their land. And so Egypt is a picture that the Assyrians are going to enslave Israel and not just simply enslave Israel in the land of Israel. Because we need to remember that before the Assyrian Empire, the most common thing that you would do if you wanted to take over a nation is you take over the nation and then you would simply make an agreement to say, you can live in your land, you can live at peace, but you're going to need to give 10%, 20% of your crops to me every year. And that would be what enslavement would look like is you live in your land and give a certain part of your produce to the overlords who took over you. And by bringing up Egypt, Hosea is saying, it's not going to look like that. When you were in Egypt, 
You were slaves in the land of Egypt, and so like that, you will now be slaves in the land of Assyria. He's not allowing them to live in Israel anymore. So it's, it's picturing what the judgment's going to be like by bringing up Egypt. And the middle of the chapter is focused on the grossness of their depravity, and that is they are so depraved that they won't even see the judgment coming. So Ephraim in verse 8, they were supposed to be like a watchman for the nation, but instead they're like a bird getting caught by a snare. And the thing about an animal snare is that if you make a good animal snare out in the woods, it's actually going to catch animals. The thing is, is that the animals can't recognize that the snare's there. They just got to be going about their way and step into it and get caught by it. And he's saying, you're not even going to see Assyria coming. You should have been able to see this coming, but you're not even going to notice that it was happening to avoid it. So, and he's saying, basically, you're so deep in depravity that Assyria is going to walk right up to you, like they're going to give you a big hug, but instead of hugging you, they're going to go and they're going to put a knife right to your throat. And it, because of the sinfulness of Israel, they won't see it happening. And then verses 11 through 17 are meant to illustrate the completeness of the devastation on the land of Israel. And these are difficult ones to go through. As for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Though they bring up children, yet I will bereave them until not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted in a pleasant meadow like Tyre. But Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what will you give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I, count, I came to hate them there. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They will bear fruit no more. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. My God will cast them away because they have not listened to him, and they will be wanderers among the nations. So this whole section has one theme, and that is on birth, pregnancy, conception, children. So it's on how their wives will miscarry. Uh, even if they have babies, their breasts will be too dry to be able to feed them that they may survive. Then if they have children that come up to age, their children will be taken from them. I think this is one of the more tragic prophecies in all of the Bible. And the question is, why, why the focus on the children? Because obviously the parents are going to face destruction. The grandparents are going to get face destruction. Uh, why focus on this really sort of grotesque imagery on the children. And so the question is, what, what are these children and these babies meant to represent? And uh, I believe that this is all about the hope of the nation of Israel. And that is, Israel will fall into despair because the future of the nation will be lost. Because one thing that is always so wonderful about children is that children bring that energy, children bring that noise and that passion. And I mean, sometimes it's frustrating to have that noise and that passion around. But on the other hand, it brings hope. Having children around brings hope for tomorrow, hope for what God will bring for the next generation. And so when God takes away the children, what is God taking away? Their hope. And so... Then we need to ask, why would God take away the hope of Israel? Why doesn't he want them to be a hopeful people anymore? And then that's to understand, well, let's remember how Israel has been living. Where has Israel placed their hope? Their hope is in their treaties with Assyria. Their hope is in the gods of the nations that are around them. Their hope is having a Sabbath where they rest but they spend the time eating and drinking and wasting away to lasciviousness with their sinful lifestyles. So they're turning to the Lord at times, but they do so in mockery, bowing down before golden idols. So their hope is in anything but the Lord himself. 
So what is God going to take away from Israel? And that is hope. But then we can also end this with with just a, a message of light. Because one of the great things about the coming of Jesus Christ is that the coming of Christ was the great coming of hope. Hope for eternal life, hope for the salvation of God's people, hope that God had not forgotten all the promises that he had made to Israel and Judah. And where did that light of hope first appear in the public ministry of Jesus? Jesus went right to the areas of Israel prophesied in Hosea. Jesus went to Israel in the north, the land surrounding Galilee, which is the lands of sin that were promised here. So the hope that God took away during the generation to follow after Hosea was the hope that God brought back when he sent his son Jesus Christ to this world. So God desires us to be a people of hope, but he wants to make sure that we place our hope in him alone. And so let us be people who put our faith in the Messiah and let us not lose sight of the very basic lesson of this chapter, these chapters, which is if you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. So if you want to live a lifestyle of sin, you're going to end up receiving the benefits of that sin eventually.